Some men seem to attract success, power, wealth, attainment with very little conscious effort. Others conquer with great difficulty. Still others fail altogether to reach their ambitions, desires, and ideals. Why is this so? Why should some men realize their ambitions easily, others with difficulty, and still others not at all? The cause cannot be physical, else the most perfect men physically would be the most successful. The difference, therefore, must be mental, must be in the mind. Hence, mind must be the creative force, must constitute the sole difference between men. It is mind, therefore, which overcomes environment and every other obstacle in the path of man. When the creative power of thought is fully understood, its effect will be seen to be marvelous. But such results cannot be secured without proper application, diligence, and concentration. The student will find that the laws governing in the mental and spiritual world are as fixed and infallible as in the material world. To secure the desired results, then, it is necessary to know the law and to comply with it. A proper compliance with the law will be found to produce the desired result with invariable exactitude. The student who learns that power comes from within, that he is weak only because he has depended on help from the outside, and who unhesitatingly throws himself on his own thought, instantly writes himself, stands erect, assumes a dominant attitude, and works miracles. It is evident, therefore, that he who fails to fully investigate and take advantage of the wonderful progress which is being made in this last and greatest science will soon be as far behind as the man who would refuse to acknowledge and accept the benefit which have accrued to mankind through an understanding of the laws of electricity. Of course, mind creates negative conditions just as readily as favorable conditions, and when we consciously or unconsciously visualize every kind of lack, limitation, and discord, we create these conditions. This is what many are unconsciously doing all of the time. This law, as well as every other law, is no respecter of persons, but is in constant operation and is relentlessly bringing to each individual exactly what he has created. In other words, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Abundance, therefore, depends upon a recognition of the laws of abundance, and the fact that mind is not only the creator, but the only creator of all there is. Certainly nothing can be created before we know that it can be created and then make the proper effort. There is no more electricity in the world today than there was fifty years ago. But until someone recognized the law by which it could be made of service, we received no benefit. Now that the law is understood, practically the whole world is lit by it. So with the law of abundance, it is only those who recognize the law and place themselves in harmony with it who share in its benefits. The scientific spirit now dominates every field of effort, relations of cause and effect are no longer ignored. The discovery of a region of law marked an epoch in human progress. It eliminated the element of uncertainty and caprice men's lives, and substituted law, reason, and certitude. Men now understand that for every result there is an adequate and definite cause, so that when a given result is desired, they seek the condition by which alone this result may be attained. The basis upon which all law rests was discovered by inductive reasoning which consists of comparing a number of separate instances with one another until the common factor which gives rise to them all is seen. It is the method of study to which the civilized nations owe the greater part of their prosperity and the more valuable part of their knowledge. It has lengthened life. It has mitigated pain. It has spanned rivers. It has brightened the night with the splendor of day. It's extended the range of vision, accelerated motion, annihilated distance, facilitated intercourse, and enabled men to descend into the sea and into the air. What wonder, then, that men soon endeavored to extend the blessing of this system of study to their method of thinking, so that when it became plainly evident that certain results followed a particular method of thinking, it only remained to classify these results. This is method, and it's scientific and it is the only method by which we shall be permitted to retain that degree of liberty and freedom which we have been accustomed to look upon as an inalienable right. 
because a people is safe at home and in the world only if national preparedness means such things as growing surpluses of health, accumulated efficiency in public and private business of whatever sort, continuous advance in the science and art of acting together, and the increasingly dominant endeavor to make all of these and all other aspects of national development centers and revolve about ascending life, single and collective, for which science, art, and ethics furnish guidance and controlling motives. The master key is based on absolute scientific truth and will unfold the possibilities that lie dormant in the individual and teach how they may be brought into powerful action to increase the person's effective capacity, bringing added energy, discernment, vigor, and mental elasticity. The student who gains an understanding of the mental laws which re-unfolded will come into the possession of an ability to secure results hitherto undreamed of and which has rewards hardly to be expressed in words. It explains the correct use of both the receptive and active elements of the mental nature and instructs the students in the recognition of opportunity. It strengthens the will and reasoning powers and teaches the cultivation and best uses of imagination, desire, the emotion. It gives initiative, tenacity of purpose, wisdom of choice, intelligent sympathy, and a thorough enjoyment of life on its higher planes. The master key teaches the use of mind power, true mind power, not any of the substitutes and perversions. It has nothing to do with hypnotism, magic, or any of the more or less fascinating deceptions by which many are led to think that something can be had for nothing. The master key cultivates and develops the understanding which will enable you to control the body and thereby the health. It improves and strengthens the memory. It develops insight, the kind of insight which is so rare, the kind which is the distinguishing characteristic of every successful businessman, the kind which enables men to discern opportunity close at hand. For thousands fail to see the opportunities almost within their grasp while they are industriously working with situations which under no possibility can be made to realize any substantial return. The master key develops mental power, which means that others instinctively recognize that you are a person of force, of character, that they want to do what you want them to do. It means that you attract men and things to you, that you are what some people call lucky, and that things just come your way that you have come into an understanding of the fundamental laws of nature and have put yourself in harmony with them, that you are in tune with the infinite, that you understand the law of attraction, the natural laws of growth, and the psychological laws on which all advantages in the social and business world rest. Mental power is creative power. It gives you the ability to create for yourself. It does not mean the ability to take something away from someone else. Nature never does things that way. Nature makes two blades for grass grow wherever one grew before, and mind power enables men to do the same thing. The master key develops insight and sagacity, increased independence, the ability and disposition to be helpful. It destroys distrust, depression, fear, melancholia, and every form of lack, limitation, and weakness. That includes pain and disease. It awakens buried talents, supplies initiative, force, energy, and vitality. It awakens an appreciation of the beautiful in art, literature, and in science. It has changed the lives of thousands of men and women by substituting definite principles for uncertain and hazy methods, and principles for the foundation upon which every system of efficiency must rest. Albert Gary, the chairman of the United States Steel Corporation, said, The services of advisors, instructors, efficiency experts in successful management are indispensable to most business enterprises of magnitude. But I deem the recognition and adoption of right principles vastly more important. The master key teaches right principles and suggests methods for making a practical application of those very same principles. In that it differs from every other course of study, it teaches that the only possible value which can attach to any principle is in its application. Many read books, take home study courses, attend lectures all of their lives without ever making any progress in demonstrating the value of the principles involved. The master key 
suggests methods by which the value of the principles taught may be demonstrated and put in actual practice in the daily experience. There is a change in the thought of the world. This change is silently transpiring in our midst and is more important than any which the world has undergone since the downfall of paganism. Science has of late made such vast discoveries, has revealed such an infinity of resources, has unveiled such enormous possibilities and such unsuspected forces that scientific men more and more hesitate to affirm certain theories as established and indubitably or to deny certain other theories as absurd or impossible. And so a new civilization is being born. Customs, creeds, and cruelty are passing. Vision, faith, and service are taking their place. The fetters of tradition are being melted off from humanity. And as the dross of materialism is being consumed, thought is being liberated, and truth is rising full-orbed before an astonished multitude. The whole world is on the eve of a new consciousness, a new power, and a new consciousness, a new power, a new realization of the resources within itself. The last century saw the most magnificent material progress in history. The present century will produce the greatest progress in mental and spiritual power. Physical science has resolved matter into molecules, molecules into atoms, and atoms into energy, and it has remained for Sir Ambrose Fleming in an address before the Royal Institution to resolve this energy into mind. He says, in its ultimate essence, energy may be incomprehensible by us, except as an exhibition of the direct operation of that which we call mind or will. Now let's see what are the most powerful forces in nature. In the mineral world, everything is solid and fixed. In the animal and vegetable kingdom, it's in a state of flux, forever changing, always being created and recreated. In the atmosphere, we find heat, light, and energy. Each realm becomes finer and more spiritual as we pass from the visible to the invisible, from the coarse to the fine, from the low potentiality to high potential. When we reach the invisible, we find energy in its purest and most volatile state. And as the most powerful forces of nature are the invisible forces, so we find that the most powerful forces of man are his invisible forces, his spiritual force. And the only way in which the spiritual force can manifest is through the process of thinking. Thinking is the only activity which the spirit possesses, and thought is the only product of thinking. Addition and subtraction are therefore a spiritual transaction. Reasoning is a spiritual process. Ideas are spiritual conceptions. Questions are spiritual searchlights. And logic, argument, and philosophy is spiritual machinery. Every thought brings into action certain physical tissue, parts of the brain, nerve, or muscle. This produces an actual physical change in the construction of the tissue. Therefore, it is only necessary to have a certain number of thoughts on a given subject in order to bring about a complete change in the physical organization of a man. This is the process by which failure is changed to success. Thoughts of courage, power, inspiration, harmony are substituted for thoughts of failure, despair, lack, limitation, and discord. And as these thoughts take root, the physical tissue is changed and the individual sees life in a new light. Old things have actually passed away. All things have become new. He is born again, this time born of the Spirit. Life has a new meaning for him. He is reconstructed and is filled with joy, confidence, hope, and energy. He sees opportunities to success to which he was heretofore blind. He recognizes possibilities which before had no meaning for him. The thought of success with which he has been impregnated are radiated to those around him, and they in turn help him onward and upward. He attracts to him new and successful associates, and this in turn changes his environment, so that by this simple exercise of thought, a man changes not only himself, but his environment, circumstances, and conditions. You will see, you must see, that we are at the dawn of a new day that the possibilities are so wonderful, so fascinating, and so limitless as to be almost bewildering. A century ago, any man with an airplane or even a Gatling gun could have annihilated a whole army equipped with the implements of warfare then in use. And so it is at present. 
Any man with a knowledge of the possibilities contained in the master key has an inconceivable advantage over the multitude.